this week on Vaticano. Pope Francis' visit to Iraq will go down in history as one of the riskiest yet most successful apostolic trips. In this week's Vaticano, we explore the aftermath of the visit by talking with some high-ranking Vatican officials who joined the Holy Father on his pilgrimage to the land of Abraham. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. In-flight press conferences on the way back to Rome from trips abroad are unique opportunities for journalists to pose questions directly to the Holy Father. The last time this happened was in November of 2019, returning from Japan. After three and a half days in Iraq in early March, the Holy Father summed up the results of the trip, saying his message of peace and fraternity was not only for Iraqis, but for the whole world. The decision to make the trip to Iraq was challenging due to major concerns regarding security and the spread of coronavirus. Do you worry that the people who came to see you could also get sick or even, or even die? I thought a lot, I prayed a lot about this, and in the end I freely made the decision. But that came from within. I said, the one who allows me to decide this way will look after the people. And so I made the decision like this, but after prayer and after awareness of the risks, after all. Pope Francis said he was aware of the criticisms that his outreach to Muslim leaders could bring. There are risks, but these decisions are always made in prayer, in dialogue, asking for advice, in reflection. They are not a whim and they are also the line that the Second Vatican Council has taught us. The Second Vatican Council took a big step forward in interreligious dialogue. Also, the later Constitution, the Council for Christian Unity and the Council for Religious Dialogue. Cardinal Ayusas accompanies us today. It's what the Pope calls human fraternity, and he's made promoting it across religions a hallmark of his pontificate. Cardinal Miguel Ángel Ayuso, is the head of the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue and responsible for overseeing Catholic-Muslim relations at the Vatican. I would just underline that Pope Francis' uh, roadmap in promoting interreligious dialogue has three main fundamental points of reference. The first one is to, to consider the role of religions in society. The second one, the authentic uh, religiosity we have to experience in our uh, personal, in most inner conscience. And then, mm, thirdly, the importance to work uh, side by side as brothers and sisters in order to, to build peace in society. I think that the Pope's visit has originated besides all these sufferings the people have suffered that uh, there is a new a new hope because they have been around the pope in a spirit of communion in a spirit of uh, friendship that has been really very 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 positive and this has shown also to the christians that they are part of society Cardinal Ayuso says Pope Francis follows in the footsteps of St. John Paul II, whose dream was to visit Iraq in 2000 to start the new millennium. This papal visit is another milestone in the process of promoting interreligious dialogue around the world and encouraging the Christian community to remain in Iraq. 
Uh, my experience, because I was present there accompanying the Holy Father, was very touching. This is the witness to the world uh, to show that besides the, the, the complexity of our problems, uh, there is in reality the possibility of living together and promoting together this coexistence that particularly in Iraq, like in other parts of the world, we are in need of. It's too early to judge the long-term effects of Pope Francis' visit to Iraq, but initial reactions are that it was very positive for the Christian community there. In December of 2020, Christmas was proclaimed as a national holiday in Iraq. On the occasion of Pope Francis' March 5th to 8th visit, the Iraqi government established the 6th of March as the National Day of Coexistence for all Iraqi people from here forward. And though few noticed it, on March the 8th, the day Pope Francis left the country, the nation's president, Barham Sali, ratified the so-called Yazidi Female Survivors Bill. I'm proud to sign the bill for Yazidi female survivors into law, an important step to help survivors of atrocities by ISIS against Yazidis, Christians, and Turkmen. Justice, restitution are crucial to ensure such horrendous crimes never happen again. The law is called the Yazidi Female Survivors Bill, but it applies to both men and women belonging to ethnic and religious minorities, such as Turkmen, Shabak, and Christians. It also sets out August the 3rd as a day of remembrance for the crimes committed against the Yazidis. The bill identifies the atrocities ISIS committed against minorities as genocide and crimes against humanity. The persecution has left 250,000 Yazidis displaced from their homes. 2,500 are missing or in captivity. Numerous women and children are believed to be under ISIS control. According to the United Nations, about 5,000 men were killed and 7,000 women and girls were sold into prostitution. A Yazidi leader was part of Pope Francis' interreligious meeting at Ur, the birthplace of Abraham. Prior to the Pope's departure, Ghazi, from the Yazidi community in Rome, shared with us his hopes for the positive effects of Pope Francis' visit. We asked, and we are still asking, the whole world to help us as a minority. We don't want war anymore. We want peace. We don't want to kill and we don't want our children to learn killing. We want to learn peace, especially between the different religions. We want to live religions in Iraq and everywhere else. If not, we prefer to immigrate to another place. Kurdish news outlet Ruda.net reports that the new legislation guarantees job opportunities for ISIS survivors by allocating them 2% of jobs in Iraq's public sector, along with a fixed salary and a piece of land. In a few moments, we'll be back with more on Vaticano.
ISIS left death and destruction in its wake on Iraq's Nineveh plain. After ISIS was beaten back in 2017, the Catholic charitable organization Aid to the Church in Need launched a modern-day Marshall Plan aimed at restoring the region through housing rehabilitation and offering employment opportunities. Aid to the Church in Need registered 20,000 families that fled the Nineveh Plain and nearly 15,000 homes that needed to be rebuilt. I find exciting project now is... Regina Lynch traveled with the Holy Father, representing two organizations, Aid to the Church in Need and Ruaco, both working to rebuild the Christian presence in Iraq. The Church in Need has been, in the recent years now, after we moved out of repairing the houses, repairing church structures, so like the Al Tahira Church, for example, in, in Karakosh, and convents for the sisters, community halls. Regina says that it was a proud moment on March the 7th when they were able to welcome the Holy Father at the Church of the Immaculate Conception in Karakosh. It had been used by ISIS fighters as a training ground, literally a firing range, after the Christian population fled in 2014. But with the help of aid to the church in need, it was completely restored in time for Pope Francis' arrival. And it's not their only success story. But one really, I find, exciting project now is we're uh, granting scholarships to the students at the Catholic University in Erbil. This is a university that has existed now for five years. This educational project aims to help young people receive an education and provide them with future jobs in Iraq. These projects are very important, but the visit of the Holy Father had an even greater impact and served as a reason for people to stay in their homeland. It was so inspiring and seeing the faces of, of the, the people when they were waiting for him when he came, it was so uplifting, it was overwhelming. Um, you know, in Karakosh, I was saying, we could see on, on the screen the Dominican sisters whose convent was next to the, the Church of Mad Conception were literally dancing on the rooftop. You know, and that was so beautiful, it was, uh, it was so exciting. Regina has been following the Nineveh Plain Reconstruction Project for several years. And during the papal trip, she witnessed firsthand the fruits of their labor, the families that are returning to their cities in Iraq. They made that decision. They had to flee their homes, but no, they decided to come back to this uh, town, which is like the heartland of, of the Christians in Iraq. And so, um, and to see their joy after all the sacrifices and the suffering they have made, and sufferings that continue, most probably. But there was a real sense of, um, of, of joy, of being uplifted. For Regina, the project to rebuild a stable Christian presence in northern Iraq is a long-term one. There's always the anticlimax that comes after something like this. But I believe the, the church leaders, uh, they will continue this momentum and will um, stand by their people and uh, to be the shepherds that they are, to, to lead their people through the, the ups and downs and the challenges of what it means to be a Christian in Iraq. So far, the organization has provided 6.5 million euros for the reconstruction of 2,860 houses in six different locations on the Nineveh Plain. As of mid-2020, more than half of the Christian houses registered for the reconstruction project have been repaired. It's a testament to the resilience, the fortitude, and ultimately, the faith of the local people. Any of the trips I, I go on, I'm humbled by the fervent nature of the faith of so many people who we meet, the Christians we meet, and in particular in countries where the Christians have been persecuted or still suffering persecution and discrimination. They are so proud of their faith. You know, they, 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 you, you hear it in their, their singing, but just um, they have no hesitation to show that they are Christians. And I think 
for me, it's it's a lesson. Uh, so often in, in in our countries, in our developed countries, let's say, um, sometimes we're not so brave to show that we are uh, Christians, that we have our beliefs, and um, I don't know what it is that stops us. But certainly from there, I respect and I admire and somehow envy them in this very strong faith that they have. And uh, yes, that's, that's something I, I take with me for sure, yeah. As the Beatitude goes, blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and utter every kind of evil against you falsely because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward will be great in heaven. We'll be back after a short break with more on Vaticano. Fernando Filoni, a former Vatican diplomat, knows the situation in Iraq better than most. He was the apostolic nuncio in Baghdad during the U.S. invasion of Iraq on March 19, 2003. He remained there for the entirety of his diplomatic assignment throughout the first years of the Second Iraq War. St. John Paul II appointed then Archbishop Filoni as the Vatican's ambassador to Iraq and Jordan in January of 2001. At his Episcopal ordination on March 19, 2001, Pope John Paul II said he was sending him as a messenger of peace. Now Cardinal Filoni is the Grand Master of the Equestrian Order of the Holy Sepulchre of Jerusalem, which is working to support the Church in the Holy Land. For his experience and dedication to the Iraqi people, Pope Francis invited the Cardinal to travel with him on this historic trip, and he shared the experience with EWTN. For the Iraqi people, for our Christians, for other minorities, the presence of the Pope was the international presence of the Church. So I am happy that finally so long awaited visit had occasion to be done with the pleasure of the government, the minorities, the majorities of religious society, the groups, and the Christian, uh, especially. Uh, dialogue is not question done. It's a question you have to build slowly. It is important to have this uh, turning point for the whole society. This is, was very well appreciated by the authorities but uh, also by the people. Especially in the north, where the Holy Father had occasion to meet people in Mosul, in Karakosh, and in Erbil, the people are so enthusiastic about this presence. So dialogue must now go on. I used to say for our Christians especially, it is important not to feel that they are alone. Although they are a small minority, they are not alone. This dialogue is not against them, with, but in favor of them and in favor of all the others. But also the majorities, they need the dialogue between Shia, Muslim, and Sunni, Muslim. A lot of division among them. When we were in Karakosh, I think, the whole population came on the street to, to greet us. So enthusiastically, you cannot imagine. They have a special way of cheering people. So it was so loudly. For our people, is this visit a resurrection. It means they felt that the whole Christian Catholic community are not forgetting them, are with them. 
So it is possible with this solidarity, so strong this solidarity, uh, for them is still hope. Pope Francis shared the whole time with the people there, with the bishops, the priests, and so on. But we heard also the interview he gave in the, in the, in the, in the, in the plane. I think it uh, was a moment in which he, he showed his uh, enthusiasm for this trip. One of the most difficult, I accompanied the Pope in the past many times. This is, is one of the most difficult. And not just thinking about security, not only thinking about COVID, but must because uh, the perception that uh, this population, after 20 years of the last war, these people needed to be encouraged. And the Pope felt that this was his mission, to encourage and to give hope to them. And his presence, sometimes in some silent presence, sometimes talking, In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace be with you. It was a joy, but also a concern that Pope Francis brought to his first Wednesday general audience back in the Vatican after the apostolic trip, where his mind was still on Iraq's Christians. The popolo iracheno ha diritto a vivere in pace. The Iraqi people have the right to live in peace. They have the right to rediscover the dignity that belongs to them. The Holy Father said his soul is filled with gratitude for those who received him and that the challenge for Iraq now is to build fraternity. <laughs>